Hi everyone, welcome back to a Neuro 481 lecture. Uh, today's lecture is pretty fun and interesting. It's about stereotactic coordinates and how they're used. And uh, also we'll do some uh, comparative analysis between rat and human brain in the process. So uh, I thought I'd start with a little clinical application question like I usually like to do. And uh, this one says, a 60-year-old man has a resting tremor, slow movement, rigidity, axial instability um, while walking. And he also has occasional mental confusion, difficulty sleeping, and depression. So you can imagine just from these symptoms, they all kind of ring a bell, this constellation of symptoms uh, as being Parkinson's disease. And sure enough, it says in the question, he has several side effects from his levodopa medications. So that's the standard of care treatment uh, with pharmacological intervention. So you consider stereotactically inserting a deep brain stimulator for this person. The question is, where should it be inserted or implanted? So uh, the options are subthalamic nucleus, globus pallidus interna, or the centromedian nucleus of the thalamus. So uh, you've probably heard of the subthalamic nucleus. That's certainly a viable option. In fact, this has been shown to be a very successful uh, intervention at uh, eliminating the tremor, this sort of 2 to 3 hertz tremor that you see in Parkinson's patients. And uh, it can also, uh, the subthalamic nucleus in particular, um, you can get pretty successful uh, DBS, deep brain stimulation therapy, uh, with low stimulation levels, and, and you're also able to lower your medication. Interestingly, though, it turns out that you can actually use the globus pallidus interna as a target as well. Uh, in some cases, this has actually shown better results, like for uh, fewer psychiatric symptoms. But in general, it also takes higher stimulation levels to have the same success. There's also ablation uh, approaches, so you can ablate certain nuclei in the brain, like the centromedian nucleus of the thalamus, and uh, this is what Michael J. Fox had done for his, his Parkinson's disease. And uh, it, it, all of these can be immensely successful uh, given the right choice of patient and target. Uh, they all have pluses and minuses about them, so you try to balance uh, all the good and bad to fit your specific patient profile. But it turns out that none of these is particularly good at uh, some of the effects of Parkinson's disease, like the bradykinesia or the rigidity or the gait, and certainly not uh, effective at preventing the dementia. This is a neurodegenerative disease. It, it uh, does decline into dementia, and, and the stimulator doesn't help that, unfortunately. So in this patient, uh, just based off the limited information that we have, we could probably say that the globus pallidus interna would be uh, the ideal target uh, due to this patient's psychiatric sort of symptoms, the, the depression and others. So, uh, But of course, like I said, there can be many valid options here. There's not exactly one right answer, and it probably depends on a lot more detail than we're given here in this problem. But... Deep brain stimulators, in general, are, are inserted with various forms of stereotactic approaches. Uh, we'll talk about that a little more today. And, and, and it is interesting, just the, the mechanism of this. You know, we, we originally thought that we were stimulating things, and then there was uh, uh, early ideas that perhaps these stimulators were actually exhausting the neurons or, or inhibiting the neurons and preventing outflow from this subthalamic nuclei, uh, the tracks that lead out from there, the efferent tracks, and the, the ultimately go back to the cerebral cortex and modulate motor output. And then it sort of swung back into this idea that we are in fact activating these efferent pathways from the subthalamic nucleus and, and, and or uh, globus pallidus. So um, particularly efferents that go back up to layer five uh, in the cortex we talked about in in the histology section, how layer five is an output layer of the motor cortex. And uh, it seems to be that this uh, stimulation is perhaps activating or at least desynchronizing uh, these sort of synchronous oscillations in layer five. So the synchrony is the tremor, the, the coordinated neural uh, pulses that cause this sort of tremor. And by desynchronizing that uh, synchronous activity in layer five, it seems that we can essentially dissipate the tremor-like output. Interestingly, if you try to imitate the stimulation of the subthalamic nucleus, I, uh, like with optogenetics, 
so you're directly influencing these neurons, you can do either excitation or inhibition with optogenetics, and neither one really benefited uh, at least the rodent model of Parkinson's disease. But interestingly, when, when they influenced the layer 5 neurons in the cortex, uh, again with optogenetics, uh, it turned out that, that inf the efferent output from the basal ganglia onto layer 5 was the most influential factor in sort of uh, desynchronizing that tremor-like output from the motor cortex. Okay, so why am I mentioning any of this? Well, obviously for any of this sort of uh, clinical intervention in movement disorders uh, or a whole variety of other neurological disorders, and also for any sort of research investigation in, in animals and function of uh, certain parts of the brain in animals, it's essential to understand stereotactics. Now, stereotactic is sort of a conglomeration of Greek and Latin. The original word was stereotaxis, uh, referring to stereo, sort of a three-dimensional solid, and uh, taxis, its organization, like taxonomy. But uh, it's, it's uh, eventually evolved into stereotactic because tactic refers to the Latin tactile. You can touch it, and we're sort of intervening with uh, tactile uh, instruments into the brain. So uh, if you don't like uh, conglomerate Greek and Latin, that's that's appropriate. Uh, you can use the word stereotaxis, sorry, stereotaxis, which is typically used with animal surgeries anyway. Um, but in general, in neurological surgery, you would refer to stereotactics. So the places where this is most commonly used would be in rat and human, I would guess. So we're going to talk about uh, both rat and human stereotactic surgery. So let's just look at some uh, gross views of the brains. So if we compare rat versus human brain here, you can see some really obvious differences right off the bat. So in the rat, uh, remember, these, these the brain develops from a folding of the neural tube. So the neural tube folds itself into a tube first, and then that whole tube folds itself in funny ways and and then the forebrain kind of grows out and over the top of it like a mushroom in the human that's expansive it's massive this whole forebrain development develops through this sort of fox g1 pathway and and a lot of other molecular signaling events but you can see in the rat that that doesn't really happen in fact the whole brain uh, spinal cord brainstem forebrain seems to be essentially along the same axis and uh, at the tip of the brain, you can see a little bulb. That is the olfactory bulb, and it's massive. It's, uh, you know, like a quarter the size of the brain almost. So uh, in rats, obviously, foraging for food and smelling food is, is essential to their survival, and the olfactory bulb, as a percentage of the brain size, seems to represent that. So the anterior portion, uh, or rostral, most rostral tip of the brain, is the olfactory bulb. Um, and then we can see the cortex itself looks very smooth compared to the cerebral cortex of the human. And then just behind or inferior to the, uh, or you, you would say caudal to the cerebral cortex of the rat, you can see the little uh, bump of cerebellum there on the back end. So in, in the human brain, the cerebellum sort of sits under the massive mushroom of the brain. Now, in terms of uh, human and rat histology, I've tried to take two coronal sections here straight through the same section of brain relative, uh, relatively between human and rat and uh, put them into what appears to be the same size. So if we shrunk the human brain down to the size of a rat brain, you can see immediately that uh, the thickness of the cortex as a percentage of the whole brain, the thickness of the cortex seems a lot thinner. Uh, but what's actually going on here is uh, the, the human cortex is about two millimeters thick. The rat cortex is about one millimeter thick. So, um, so the rat cortex, surprisingly, is, is actually quite thick for such a little rat. But the problem here is that there are hardly any uh, interconnections amongst all those neurons, amongst that millimeter of cerebral cortex in the rat. You can see in the human brain, the white matter makes up a su substantial portion of the mass of the, cer of the cerebrum. So... Uh, there are a lot of a lot lots of interconnectivity here amongst all these little neurons in the cortex, and you can see that. Like for example, in the internal capsule, you can see that it's much thicker and much more white matter compared to the rat, where uh, 
there's lots of little uh, purple neuron bodies in here that make it hard to even tell that there's much white matter there. You can also see another substantial difference here between the hippocampi of human versus rat. So in the human, uh, the hippocampus is down near the inferior portion of the lateral ventricle. So uh, remember, we can see uh, both the superior portion uh, up near the third ventricle, and you can see the inferior portion of the ventricle, which follows the hippocampus. It's this weird folding of dark neurons with the with the dentate gyrus and all, all these densely packed neurons. Uh, so the lateral ventricle is next to the hippocampus in both human and rat, but in humans, whatever happened evolutionarily, uh, the hippocampus seems to have uh, moved with this sort of expansive, uh, this expansion of all the folds of the forebrain, and the hippocampus has essentially gone inferiorly, whereas in the rat, the hippocampus essentially sits over the thalamus. You have a large thal uh, thalamic uh, portion here in the center, and the hippocampus sits essentially on top of it. So the hippocampus, if you're dissecting hippocampal neurons, for example, it's quite easy to just separate off the uh, cortical fold of the rat brain and then reach the hippocampal neurons. As far as the lateral ventricles go, you can see they both have choroid plexus in them, uh, but in the human, they're substantially larger, it seems like, at least relative to brain size, probably to bathe these neurons in more cerebral spinal fluid and uh, be a better support for such a massive uh, soft tissue organ. On the lateral edge of the lateral ventricle, you can see the caudate in there. And if you look endoscopically in the ventricle, you'll also see this nice bulge that, that sort of juts out in into the ventricle that is the caudate that uh, large purple nucleus and that caudate nucleus in the human tightly follows the lateral ventricle and uh, it's quite an obvious nucleus whereas in the rat it, it, it does follow the lateral ventricle in a way but not as tightly and not as obviously you can also see that uh, the thalamus as a proportion of brain size the thalamus makes up a substantially large portion of the rat brain Whereas in the human brain, it's sort of, you know, it, it serves this sort of uh, basal primitive function. It's the, the primitive brain, and it, it's essentially maintained the same size in the human while all the complexity of the cortex is expanded out. So again, the rat's thalamus is fairly large compared to the overall size of the brain. So those are what I think are some of the main differences between rat and human brain. There's obviously a lot more, and you're welcome to take a look at more of those details. Now, for the rat brain, there's this really nice atlas of stereotaxic coordinates uh, that's been put together, and normally we have this book available to each of you in the lab, but uh, if you log in with your institutional login, you can have access to a, an electronic copy of this, and that's what we'll use for this lab today. So this book is divided into uh, several sections. They're, they do coronal sections through the whole rat brain, and then they do the whole rat brain again in sagittal sections, and then again in horizontal sections. And the stains that they use are either Cressel violet or the acetylcholinesterase. We will not use any acetylcholinesterase stains in this lab. The only ones you need to know are the Cressel violet. That's all we're going to uh, utilize in this course. So. Um, if we look at how this is arranged for stereotactic coordinates, they essentially overlay the brain on a millimeter by millimeter grid system. And when you're doing this, uh, a very useful coordinate is to find bregma, which is uh, the intersection of the coronal and sagittal sutures on the skull. And so bregma can be marked as the 0, 0, 0 point. So if we do like an X, Y, Z uh, Cartesian coordinate system, the we can mark 0, 0, 0 as the bregma on the skull and then from there we can easily access like if we're doing surgery on the rat brain we can easily access any coordinates that we need to um, and so uh, and, and i should point out too there are other coordinate systems for example you can use an interoral coordinate system where the zero 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 point is uh, at the interoral line uh, so if you use a head holder that clamps that interoral line on the external auditory meatus, that um, can serve as a reference point too. And there's different reasons to do each one. Uh, it, it talks about in the introduction of this book uh, kind of the reasons that you would want to use one versus the other. But in general, you'll never be off by more than half a millimeter. 
if you average the the coordinates from either the interaural or the brigma coordinate system you're you're most likely to get the most accurate measurement but in general regardless of the type of rat that you use as long as it's an adult rat um, in general you won't be off by more than half a millimeter but uh, again there's a lot of details about the accuracy of these measurements that are mentioned in the book so if you're actually doing rat surgeries you should be aware of those um, so for this course we're only going to use the Bregma coordinate system so don't worry about the other ones okay now uh, the way this works is uh, like I said you mark your 000, zero point XYZ or XYZ, uh, you mark that on Bregma on top of the skull. So the surface of the rat brain is actually going to be negative one uh, millimeters. So uh, there's a couple ways of, of writing these. You can say um, anterior, posterior, or ventral, dorsal, and you can also use positive or negative numbers. So if you use uh, positive and negative numbers, in theory, yes, you should not have to say anterior or posterior, but sometimes it's nice to be redundant. Um, it doesn't make a double negative. So, uh, for example, if I have something that's one millimeter posterior, I might say negative one millimeter or negative one millimeter posterior. Either of those is correct and okay. Similarly, the surface of the brain, the top surface of the brain, sits one millimeter below the skull, be below the surface of the skull, where my measurement reference point is on, on Bregma. And so I could say either one millimeter ventral to the Bregma point, or I can say negative one millimeter, or I can say negative one millimeter ventral. Put them both together. That's all okay. Now, in the human brain, we don't have nice accuracy like this. Things can be off between individuals much more than just a millimeter. And so we don't have um, a standardized uh, reference that's used for neurological surgery. Rather, what's much more accurate, uh, more accurate than any stereotactic manual or, or uh, reference book, is actually taking an image of the brain itself, either with CT or MRI. And we'll talk about those options uh, towards the end of this course. But uh, MRI can get well within a millimeter of resolution, much less than that, actually, for good MRI machines. And <clears throat> we can use that image to actually coordinate it to the patient's brain during surgery. Use, uh, you can use a lot of different things. You can either use a frame that's mounted on the skull and have a framed stereotactic system. Uh, so, for example, doing this microelectrode in this Parkinson's patient that I did, uh, for a deep brain stimulator, you can see there's a stereotactic frame mounted onto the skull. But you can also do um, frameless stereotactics by using a little wand and a camera system that's set up in the room. So what you can do is, before the patient gets an MRI, you put these little markers uh, on, a, on the person's head and uh, send them through the MRI machine. And so you have these little, what look like bumps, that show up on the MRI on the surface of the skull or on the surface of the scalp. And when you when you get the patient back into surgery, use a little wand that has three points on it that are detected by the camera, they're reflective points. And the camera system is mounted so that it can essentially detect these points and it knows the distance between them so it knows how far away it is and it can calibrate itself in three dimensions. And you put the tip of the wand on each of the markers on the patient's head and register that that uh, three-dimensional imagery obtained by the camera to the MRI. You tell it which marker you're touching and coordinate that to the marker that's on the MRI of the patient's head. And it calibrates and registers the imagery together. And in fact, you can do more than one type of registration. For example, if you have an MRI and you also have a PET scan or a CT scan or other things that you want to coordinate all these systems together, you can use essentially linear algebra to um, to make all the imagery fit together. So this sort of multimodality integration is really effective at helping us target exactly where a lesion is in the brain. And for example, uh, most commonly I would say uh, is it's used in a biopsy when you're trying to biopsy an unknown lesion in the brain, see if it's tumor or infection or some other uh, pathological process. Um, but there's some downsides to it as well. Uh, for example, during surgery, the when you open up the dura and you have cerebral spinal fluid leaking out over time during the operation, the brain begins to sink. It's essentially like 
cold oatmeal and it eventually condenses down and is no longer buoyed up by the cerebral spinal fluid. And so the imagery is not very accurate. Um, <clears throat> the other problem is if you're doing an operation under a microscope, uh, the microscope gets in the way of the wand and, and, and showing you where you are in three dimensions. So you have to use these sort of dynamic reference frames and things like that. But uh, overall, it's a really cool technology. Ideally, what you would do is have an intraoperative MRI machine that can rescan the patient after they've been under surgery for a while and after you've resected some of the tissue. And that way you can recalibrate where the tissue has shifted to and where you're, uh, where you are operating and what you're targeting exactly. But that, that's expensive, obviously, and, and, and a, lot of, a lot of other logistical issues with that. Now, for an electrode placement, like for Parkinson's disease, like we talked about, uh, that can be a little different. So there is some utility in using stereotactic imagery, but what is actually much more helpful is physiologic recording from the electrode itself. So um, <clears throat> normally, if you record from an electrode, as you penetrate down through the brain, you'll pick up uh, an, a random assortment of neurons firing, what sounds sort of like, uh, if you convert those neur neuronal spikes into a uh, sound, it essentially sounds like white noise on a TV, on an old TV set, something like that. But uh, as you get down into the subthalamic nucleus, it has very a very specific uh, neuronal firing pattern, which you can confirm by uh, statistical analysis and comparison. Uh, there are characteristics of any uh, particular nucleus that you're targeting uh, that can be f uh, physiologically confirmed, but uh, it, it sounds different too. You can immediately hear it as you enter into the subthalamic nucleus. It sounds a lot more like rain hitting a glass window pane. So um, just, it's just interesting how these sort of confirmatory methods of making sure that your stereotactics are hitting the right target uh, they can differ substantially depending on what you're trying to do. Okay, let's get some practice using this uh, rat atlas. So <clears throat> the first uh, image that I'm going to show you is plate 60. So you can uh, open up your electronic version and go to plate 60. And let's say that I ask you that for the coordinates of the lateral ventricle, like maybe you're going to put in a little catheter that can inject medication into the lateral ventricle for an experiment. So uh, in general, you can just pick uh, the center of the structure. That's probably the most likely target that you're, or that, 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 that makes you most likely to hit the target that you're aiming for. So uh, from plate 60, go to the coordinate system and here you can make sure you use the Bregma coordinate system, which are the numbers that are on the top and on the right. Uh, so, and remember too, that the book has to tell you what slice you're at in terms of, for example, in this coronal slice, you're uh, 3.24 millimeters posterior or negative 3.24 millimeters. So all we have to do is use the Bregma coordinate system to get the other two coordinates. So if we measure here, I would say ventrally we're at about negative 4 millimeters and laterally about 4.7 millimeters or 4.8 millimeters, somewhere in that region. Obviously I'll give you room for error if you're doing this on an exam. Okay, let's try that again on uh, a sagittal section this time. And this time I'm going to make you find something. So you have to find the anterior commissure of the posterior limb. So there's an index of abbreviations in the back of the book. If you don't know how something is abbreviated, you can always look it up. In general, though, you can see at the bottom that the list of abbreviations is, is pretty complete on the actual page that you're looking for structures. So uh, anterior commissure posterior limb you'll find is abbreviated ACP. So if we look for where ACP is marked on the stereotactic diagram, we can see uh, that it's this uh, white matter structure. And like I said, one of the coordinates has to just be given to you from the slice from which the diagram is taken. So in this case, it tells us that we're lateral 2.62 millimeters. So we can measure on the Bregma coordinate system again from here and find that we're posterior about minus 0.3 millimeters or so, and we're ventral about seven and a half millimeters.
So anything in that range it, it, within half a millimeter, I would say, is accurate. And that should hold true even if you're using uh, different sections, whether you use a coronal or a sagittal or a horizontal section. There can be subtle differences, of course, but in general, they should still be, um, they should still match with each other. Okay, I want you to try one more on a horizontal section. So here, try to find the medial amygdala posterior dorsal nucleus. So um, you can look up, or here it says MEPD is the abbreviation. And you can find it's this dense collection of uh, Kressel stained uh, uh, neurons here. And so let me actually uh, have you pause the video and make sure that you can do this on your own before I give you any answers. Make sure you feel comfortable doing this because it will be on the exam. So uh, you can restart the video and uh, you should see that the Brigma coordinate system tells us that we're at negative 8.42 millimeters ventral. That's what's given on the slice and then uh, about three and a half millimeters posterior and three and a half, 3.4 millimeters lateral approximately. Okay, now let's actually look at a question like you would see on the exam. So uh, as usual in this lab, we try to do application questions. And so let's say you're studying how the hypothalamus controls hormone release from the pituitary gland. So you're going to stimul stimulate neurons in the paraventricular hypothalamic nucleus, and specifically the lateral magnocellular part, and then measure the resulting levels of hormone in the bloodstream. So we're going to really target down to very specific neurons and see what these neurons control, if anything. And uh, <clears throat> so the question here is, where will you position your stimulating electrode? So first of all, you need to uh, figure out... Uh, where this structure is in the brain. You can use any slice, it doesn't matter which uh, section, horizontal, sagittal, whatever, uh, and then um, <clears throat> find the structure and then decide where you would position your stimulating electrode. So again, pause the video here, make sure you can do this on your own, and then uh, when you're ready, unpause it and we'll go through the answers. All right, so to solve this, all we have to do is go to the list of abbreviations and we find that uh, for this particular structure, the abbreviation is PALM, P-A-L-M. And if we go to the index of structures, we can find where each structure can be found on different sections or on different plates. And so if we go to, um, it gives us a lot of options here. It looks like uh, plates 47 to 49, 164, 188. All these uh, plates should have that structure that we're looking for. But we should go through the plates and kind of try to find the center of this region. So um, so if we look at plate 188, for example, we're kind of in this uh, horizontal section here. That's good, it kind of gives us an idea of how we're spatially oriented here. But let's actually go to figure 48, kind of in between the 40, 47 to 49 here. So uh, let's find the palm nucleus. Yep, there it is, almost in the middle there. And again, this is in the hypothalamus. So we're gonna uh, get the coordinate system here. It tells us here that we're at negative 1.80 millimeters posterior. And you can actually look up in the top left there and see the line that's drawn specifically through where your section was taken from. And it's worth pointing out here too that if we were doing this in lab like we normally would, um, and you were using actual tissue slices under the, the microscope, you would have to match your tissue sections to the actual rat atlas, which don't always match up perfectly. Sometimes you cut at oblique angles, and sometimes things are just a little squished or stretched. And so uh, the, the techniques you have to use to match this up are basically looking at each structure, look at the cortex, look at the angles of the tips of the hippocampus of the dentate gyrus, look at the caudate, putain, and the ventricles, look at every single structure and try to match it up as close as possible. That's how you match your own tissue sections to the actual sections on uh, the rat atlas. So for example, after you put your electrode into a, a target, you always want to confirm after the experiment that it was actually where you wanted it to be. And so you can take tissue sections and confirm the tip of the electrode was where you expected it to be. So anyway, okay, back to the problem. So we can see here, if we put the tip of the electrode back into the magnocellular, uh, lateral magnocellular part of the paraventricular hypothalamic nucleus, then uh, it should be positioned, like we said, negative 1.8 millimeters posteriorly 
and uh, negative 7.9 millimeters about ventrally and 0 0.5 millimeters laterally. You don't have to say left or right unless you're doing a very specific experiment on either left or right comparisons, but laterally is, is the term you should use. Okay, I think that's a pretty good summary of stereotactic coordinates in uh, the neurosciences. So the assignment that uh, you're given and that will be due is just to continue these problem sets um, using the RAT Atlas. And if you have any questions along the way, feel free to email me. Thank you very much.